Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you today. I have my topic is leadership and social change. I've been involved in social change for a good 20, 25 years. You might call it culture war. What was my topic? Women. And I want to talk to you today about a little known, but I think a very important part of the struggle for women to gain equal rights. And that is the struggle that military women had. I'm going to give a little tutorial and then I'll, I'll go into my story. In 19, there were only two laws on the U books of the United States that specifically discriminated against women. They were the so-called combat exclusion laws. They had nothing to do with women in the infantry, nothing to do with that at all. The laws very simply said, women in the Air Force could not fly planes expected to be in combat mission. That meant they couldn't fly jets. And women in uh, the Navy could not serve on ships expected to be uh, in a combat mission. Combat mission was determined by the services. The Marine Corps and the Army used those laws to develop their policies to, to restrict where women could go. These were the, the laws that were in place. So how did I get to be a women's advocate? Uh, here is my story. I graduated from the University of North Dakota with, as a dietitian. I was commissioned after graduation into the Army. Women could not be in ROTC at the time. I was commissioned into the Army as a second lieutenant, uh, and I served for almost six years. While in the Army, I met my husband, Michael, who is in the audience, and we got married. When I went to file my name change, I lost a third of my pay. And then, uh, just before I left, I was a head dietitian of a thousand bed hospital. I was 27 years old at the time. I had 120 people working for me. I had control of my own budget. And I found out the good news, I was very good at managing large organizations. The bad news is I got pregnant and lost my job. So I never thought about women's rights before in my life. And all of a sudden, hit me right in the forehead. My husband stayed in the military, so I was a military spouse. We traveled uh, all over and ended up in Washington, DC. While um, a military spouse, I got my mas master's degree. I did my thesis topic on uh, the effects of the women's movement on wives of military officers. You see that the issues that happened to me were a pivotal change in my direction. I left the field of dietetics and went into the work of women's rights. I didn't know where it was going to go, but that's where I wanted to be. When I got to uh, Washington, D.C., I really didn't know anybody, um, but a position came open uh, with a women's rights group. They got a grant from the Ford Foundation to establish a women in the military project. I applied for the job, and I got it. Uh, so I was the first director of this project. I, I think when I look, and I am really in a reflection mode, because uh, when I started this work, I was young, I was kind of angry, and I thought change happened overnight. Now I have gray hair, and I've learned a lot. But back to uh, when I was hired, I think they did one of the factors that made me effective in this role was that I had been an officer in the Army. I understood the Department of Defense, and I could talk their language. And that was very important. So I'm going to talk to you about basic principles of social change as I have organized them in my mind. I went in this, to this totally untrained in this, but this is what worked for me. The first uh, step on any social change is to chart your 
strategic vision. Where do you want to end up, and what are the steps in the middle to get there? Well, I, my goal was to repeal those laws. That was my end point. I developed steps along the way. What could I accomplish that would gain momentum? So the next thing to do is to define the terms. If you can define the terms of the debate, you own the debate. So I used Department of Defense terms, and I used their data. The terms were, what is a combat job, what is a combat support job, and what is a combat service support job. A combat job would be like fighter, pilot, or infantry. A combat service support job would be like support, logistics, military police. And a combat service support job would be like um, medical administrative. Now, women could be in the combat service support. Very few were in the, uh, in the combat support jobs, and no women were in combat jobs. So I defined the terms, and then I, I showed how each service, using their data, how each service interpreted the policies. And they all interpreted them in different ways. So women could do some things in one service and not in, a, in another service. That was the beginning of defining the terms. I wanted everybody to understand what the terms were, and I wanted them to sing off of my sheet, sheet of music. The next thing I had to do was mobilize supporters. Now, and I dealt at the national level, but this, the principles are the same at the local level, at the state level. You mobilize your supporters, your mentors, Military women, very important. If I was going to be representing them, that they respected and uh, respected me, and that they wanted to work with me because they were a great source of information. Um, I worked with the Department of Defense and people inside the Department of Defense. Uh, for when you're working to change an organization, you'd be surprised how many people inside the organization that can be very helpful to you. I worked with members of Congress, but more importantly, with their staffs. Very important. I worked with the media, because the media is, can get your message out far more than what you can do. So I mobilized my supporters. Some people are afraid of the media, or they say bad things about the media. I learned to work with the media. We had a woman in my organization, and she was very helpful. I started out by doing public service spots, easy way to get to look at a teleprompter and, and work your way through it. Um, I identified and was quite aggressive at first in identifying the reporters that I wanted to work with, those that covered the military beat in the military papers as well as my hometown paper is the Washington Post. And the New York Times is, uh, has a big bureau there. Um, so I wanted to utilize the media. Initially, it, it was slow coming, but I was a, a responsible spokesperson, and as you all know, when the, media, when the military has a, a scandal, it can be quite juicy. And when there was a juicy scandal, I, I got a lot of press attention. And the more press attention that you get, the more they know your name, the more they, uh, they refer to you. Um, I was the only person doing w military women's issues, so I always got all of the press attention. The Department of Defense even referred them to me. So utilizing the media, very important for your job. So I have my supporters in place. I um, have my, my fact sheets in place. I've defined the terms. I know what my end term objective is. Next is to pick off what I call the low-hanging fruit. What's easy? What, where can you start making some momentum? Or as uh, President uh, George H.W. Bush used to say, the big mo. How can you get the big mo? Well, I'll give you an example. The uh, Navy ha has support ships, oilers and tankers and support ships. And they get their support ships, some are Navy ships and some are civilian ships. Now, at the time, women could not serve on ships. So they didn't serve on Navy ships. 
there was a, a Navy detachment on the civilian ship. They didn't serve on, they couldn't serve there either. But the civilian ships had women in their crew. That was easy. How do you explain that? The Navy couldn't explain it. The Secretary of Defense said, get that off my plate. They opened up the military detachments to women, not the ships, but the, but the detachments. But that was the first chink in the armor. And when you pick off low-hanging fruit like that, you begin to um, build momentum. And that, then what do you do? You celebrate your success. Because one thing about change is that I didn't know at the beginning, change doesn't happen because it's right and good. Change happens because there's a political need for it to change. And all of the people that are in your tribe, in your rowboat with you, you need to celebrate your successes. It reinvigorates the faithful, plus it adds more people to your supporters. People all of a sudden want to be with a winner. Uh, you get more support inside the organization, outside the organization, money, whatever. So you celebrate your successes. Oftentimes people, it's my opinion, in social movements, uh, don't pay attention to budgets. Bad mistake. An organization's priorities are reflected in the budget. If you're not there, you're not there. It doesn't matter where it is. If, for me, if the Navy was going to add um, uh, women onto ships and they didn't have any money to retrofit for birthing for them, they weren't serious about them. But it's the same in a political situation. Say, if a mayor says that universe, or all day kindergarten is important and it's one of his priorities and it's not in the budget, it's not important. So paying attention to budget, very important. When I was at the Department of Defense, my first job there, I oversaw all the community support policy for all of the services. When I first got there, Nobody in my position had ever gone to a budget meeting. They weren't invited. I crashed the meeting. <laughs> Why are you there? Because you're talking about my budget, thank you very much. And I'm gonna be there. And I took my staff with me and they, oh, Mrs. Beecraft, you can't go in there. Well, I looked at the lay of the land. I came back, I reorganized, I established a budget shop. I said, you're, we are gonna do goals and measures based on base practices. And your job is to look at the services budgets and make sure they're funding appropriately as they're supposed to do. In the five and a half years I was there, funding for community programs increased by a third. That's huge. Pay attention to budgets. And then it comes as you're going, you reevaluate your mission, you feel reevaluate your strategies, and the circle continues all over again. So how did this story end? Um, in 1991, after the first Gulf War, some of you are, weren't even born then, but there was a Gulf War before the last Gulf Wars, um, and women were deployed overseas, and they did a fabulous job. They came back, and there was a lot of fervor. Yes, we did a great job, and the military was um, very much praised. And two congresswomen, and it's always women that do this, introduced legislation in the House to repeal the combat exclusion laws. In a past, it went out unanimously, unanimously out of the Armed Services Committee, and it passed the House. It caught the military flat foot. They never expected it. So as you know, from the House, it goes to the Senate. And, um, uh, military began mobilizing to stop this push to repeal the combat exclusion laws. And so I mobilized my troops, the women's groups, the legal groups, um, a, a committee within the Department of Defense, women veterans, and military women, primarily women pilots, because we knew we had a fight on our hands. We got together, I put together a briefing package, I wanted everybody um, talking off the same sheet of music. Remember, going back to the terms, here's where we are. Um, and we prepared 
for the battle in the Senate. We brought military pilots, flew in. We had um, lobbying groups. They didn't lobby, they educated. Big distinction. We had somebody else to do the lobbying for them. But we had groups and we went to every member of the Senate. And there were these gorgeous women pilots. I'm telling you, they were gorgeous. And people were hanging out the doors. Who are these people? Who are these people? It was very effective. We got great press. It was great. So it came down to the vote. And I didn't know which way it would go uh, until uh, Sam Nunn introduced a, a temporizing measure. And I said to the person next to me, we've got it. They don't have the votes to kill it. Well, I was in the Senate gallery with my tribe, with my supporters, and listening to the debate, you know, my heart is in my throat, what's gonna happen? And right down below me was Senator Ted Kennedy. And he was eloquent in anything that he was passionate about, and he was passionate about my issue. And I looked down, and you know what? He was reading off my fact sheets. It was perfect, it was perfect. Um, the Senate pa repeal, passed repeal, and the Department of Defense began uh, opening up opportunities for women, allowing women to uh, serve on ships. Now, if you're in, in the Navy and can't serve on a ship, you're at a distinct disadvantage. It, um, allowing uh, Air Force women to fly fighter jets. And do you know what was so unusual about this? Not unusual, but really crazy. Navy women could always fly fighter jets. They just couldn't land on a ship. I mean, go figure. So, you know, there were so many, it was really fun. You could have them in a corner. It was really fun. Um, but over the years, uh, you know, many opportunities have been open for women. Now, why was this important? Well, first of all, Anytime you have a law, it was very important for civilian women too who wanted to do defense policy, foreign service, whatever. Anytime you have a law on the books that says women can't do something, it justifies discrimination against women. It justifies keeping their, their numbers low. With the repeal of these laws, uh, women now are, are four-star generals. They couldn't get there before. They're three-star generals. They're running huge commands. They couldn't get there before. And so now we've had two more wars. And last year, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the, chair, uh, the Chiefs of Staff of the Services went to the Congress and said, we need to get rid of our policies that restrict women. And why is that? Because their policies got in the way of utilizing the talents of the people in the last two wars they fought. And so they were policy, so you know they broke the policies because they tried, had to utilize the best people. Um, women went out on patrols with the infantry. The, the policies and the rationale behind the policies fell apart in, in the actual execution of the war. So they are now reevaluating uh, and opening more positions for women. Will they be in the infantry? The military, or the Marine Corps is now actually um, trying that, uh, to putting women through the basic infantry course. Will they be there? I don't care. If they can be there and meet the same standards that are relevant to the job, people should be able to do what they want to do, as, and it's better for our military readiness to use all of the talent. So that's my story. Chain, and change, remember, doesn't happen because it's right and good. Change happens because there's a political need for it to change. And the significant part is right now, it's not women advocates uh, arguing for expanded opportunities for women. It's, it's the chiefs. Women have earned their due. Thank you.